Hello, hello, lovely listeners. So you guys might remember that we had Cara Lowenthal on the podcast not that long ago, although I'll be honest, my brain is like, what day is it? Was it two years ago? <laughs> Who knows? Um, because, you know, time is all about how we think about it. Um, and anyway, so she has written a book, which you were writing while we were working together. It's called Take Back Your Brain. It's available for pre-order right now. The link is in the show notes. If you're like, oh, I loved Cara and I want to buy that book immediately, do that right now. It doesn't have to take time. You can listen to us as you go. Um, but yeah, Cara, tell us a little bit about just the the book and the why behind the yeah. book and who it's for. Yeah. And if you want to pre-order the book, takebackyourbrainbook.com is the, you can, don't even have to check the show notes. You can go right there. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. So um, the book is really for anybody who's been socialized as a woman, meaning anybody who has absorbed the messages that society gives women. And it, the book is all about understanding how your brain works, how it absorbs messages from society, right? Society teaches us everything, like what foods are safe to eat, when are you supposed to wear pants and when can you take them off? Like being dressed to go outside, not peeing in the living room. All these things are things we not peeing in the living room, not peeing in the living room after oh. a certain age. Usually, I mean, unless you're into that, which is fine. I'm not kink shaming, <laughs> but in general, right? Society, we learn how to just be a person in society from all of the, you know, our parents teach us, but we also learn from the society around us, and that includes things that are a lot more nebulous, like. What's your worth? What's your value? What's important about you? What do other people think or care about about you, right? And so women are socialized to believe certain things about themselves, that their appearance matters more than almost anything else, that their whole purpose in life is to be of service to other people and make other people happy, that they should be nice and polite and pretty and well-behaved and right, all of these very specific ways of being that are different from what men are taught that they should be. So that's socialization. That's what I call social socialization. And it impacts the way you think about yourself. Of course, if you're taught, if you're taught, I need to be pretty and quiet and well-behaved to be accepted, then you're going to internalize that. And that's going to be sort of the voice in your head telling you what to do. And so the book really does a deep dive into how does that happen? What are the messages that we learn and our messages may be different based on different identities, right? It's not just gender. There's religion and race and sexual orientation and body size and all sorts of things. And I go over all that in the book. And then this, so that's the first half of the book is what's happening to your brain? <laughs> Why is your brain the way it is? And then the second half of the book is really diving into different areas to work through more specifically what are the messages we absorb in this area and how to change those thoughts. And so I have a whole chapter on kind of women and their relationship to their time, right? Like they're kind of, I don't like the term time management as I know you don't either, but like how women are socialized to think about like spending their time, the worth and value of their time, what they should be using their time on and kind of how responsible they're socialized to be for like everything that's happening around them. Yes. Um. So that's what the book is about. And that's what that particular chapter is about. Amazing. <clears throat> So there's two things that we're going to be discussing today with Cara. One is I bet so many of you listening have thought at some point that you would love to write a book or maybe it's not a book, but it's like a specific project that you would love to do that you don't have time for. And maybe you've not had time for it for like a decade now. So one of the things we're going to speak about is um, time as it relates to creating a book, which is a pretty big undertaking. And I do think probably most people can relate in terms of wanting to have a book, but maybe it's something else, a, pro a podcast or whatever. So think about your big project and we're going to speak through a lens of how to get that done. Um, and the second thing is obviously going to be just coming back to a few of the things that we touched on last time around time and how we've been socialized around time and how to kind of unbreak not unbreak, break out of that. Just warning in case you can hear this, that I sound a bit nasally, maybe Cara can. I do have, I am coming off the back of like January-ness and like <laughs> ears block, nose block, throat block. Like I feel good today. Um, otherwise I won't be doing this, but maybe you can sense the nasal. So sorry about that. Okay, so let's start with like, if it doesn't take time to write a book, what does it take? I kind of want to answer that with like a question. Yeah. <laughs> I just want to suggest another question, which is yeah. even before we get into how, you know, what does it take to produce something is 
what's the purpose for which you are producing it? And like, what is that outcome that you want? Right. So if you want to write a book because you just want to have written it, then all you need is whatever is the minimal amount of time to write a book. If you want your book to hit the bestseller list, which I do, then you need to spend more time on it, right? It's like, what's the outcome? Because people just think like, oh, I want a book. I want a podcast. But like, is that is that actually the outcome you want? What is it you want? You want to be like a leading person in your field. You want to be on Oprah. You want to make a million dollars, right? Like, why do you want the thing that you think you want? And I think that in or like you actually need to have clarity on that in order to think about like, first of all, if I picked the right thing to get to the thing I want and what is going to be required of me, right? So, you know, if it's not time, is it energy? Is it focus? Is it belief? Is it attention? Is it delegating? Is it whatever? A lot of that's going to depend. I don't think you get the best answer if all you're looking at what is what is the product I'm trying to create. You really have to be asking yourself like, okay, there's some end result I want from this. It's a feeling. It's an outcome. It's a belief I want to have about myself, whatever that is that I think this outcome is going to get me to. And so what is needed to create that outcome? So for me, I didn't sort of want a book just to have a book or to have written a book. In that case, I could have just written a book and been done. And that would have been a pretty short period of time. I wanted a book to um, to raise my kind of profile to the next level, right? Like, I mean, obviously levels are kind of arbitrary, but it's sort of, this is my current sphere of influence. And I want my sphere of influence and my kind of public um, profile to be elevated. And so I'm going to use a book to do that. Okay. Well, that's a totally, now I got to think about, you know, what does it take? It takes like belief in myself. It takes, um, for me, it took like having done my work for a while and having perspective in order to really be ready to say something, you know, new and fresh. Like I've had the following to write a book or to get a book deal for a while, but I didn't do it until I felt like, you know, I really had a book's worth of things to say. And the time to write the book is actually the least, imp- I mean, especially if you're someone like us, who's, I mean, I have like 300 podcast episodes. I've like said everything I say a lot of times. <laughs> it wasn't so much like coming up with new ideas. It was like synthesizing everything that I had already done and putting it in one place. Um, so I think for me, what was required to write the book was like, acceptance of the way I work, which is I was going to write 90% of the book in the last two months, probably no matter what, which is what happened. Um, And then the thing I think I didn't have was like a a good enough understanding of the entire process that happens after that, which I'm like now experiencing in real time. And then if I do this again, I would have a much better idea of like, it's like being like, okay, I built the car. Oh, I don't actually know how far I'm supposed to drive it. Oh, okay. Actually that place is far. And then sort of adapting as you go along. Yes, I love what you shared about kind of like, I think some people think like the book is the goal, but for you, the book it, the book is a tool towards the goal. Yeah. And that's the difference. And one of the things we spoke about before we hit recording is like the time investment or the time that you want to give, how you want to spend your time to ensure that you and the book collaborate to achieve that goal mm-hmm. together. Yeah, I mean, if I, I think even now, like I, I a little bit thought I didn't have enough like when I was thinking about the amount of time or the amount of effort and the goal and the purpose, if I'd had at the beginning, I just would have had my mindset in a different place. Like I'm still in it and I'm going, I'm doing it. But I think if I'd started out being like, oh, writing the book is just, that's the first one tenth of the time and effort of this project. Yes. You know, that's just like, that's the easy part. And now there's going to be like two years of like, edits. And I mean, I went a traditional publisher route. Obviously, if you self-publish on Amazon, this can all go a lot faster. But if you are working with a traditional publishing house, which I am, it's like they have a whole process you got to go through and you're not in control of that. I mean, I think another like interesting thing to think about with yours, if especially if you're thinking about a book or something else that's like going to involve other kind of traditional entities is like entrepreneur speed and process is very different than big established institutions speed and process. And I'm not saying ours is better. Like we break more shit along the way. I'm sure the book would have had, (laughs) you know, the book wouldn't be as good as it is if it hadn't been edited by professionals and typeset and everything. But nevertheless, like that is a whole other, like almost like timeline and sense of time that you're moving in now. You're like outside of yours and you're like in an institutions and you're going along that process. Um, 
And I think if I had set out being like, okay, writing this book is the first 10%. Everything that comes after that is really like, that's the real work to get to where I want to go. I think I would have been like less surprised along the way to be like, oh my God, this is still going on. Or like, mm -hmm. this is still, you know, but I'm also somebody who, you know, like, I, I mean, when I look at what my goals are, I'm like, well, okay, of course you're trying to have your book be like in the top 0.1% of books published, like yes. the top 2% of books published. Yes. Um, so also just sort of, you know, keeping perspective on, like, it's easy for me to be like, oh, this takes, you know, quote unquote, so much time, but like, well, is that true relative to what I'm trying to do? Like, it'd be like saying like, I'm trying to build a skyscraper with my hands and then being like, well, gosh, this is taking a long time. Well, that's a pretty big project. So there's some amount of time and effort that's just going to take. Yes. And I also like, I, I think when we're in it, our brain loves the known variables and the known variable is the time you are spending now. And so we like to make decisions based off of the money it's going to cost now, the time it's going to spend now. And we want to make decisions instead based off of like, I call it the return on time invested, mm -hmm. right? And when you make decisions based on that return, of course, you're like, yeah, two years to get in the top 0.1% or 2%, whatever it was of all books ever read, you're like, yeah, yeah, that sounds great. But our brain is like, no, what do we know right now? And do I want to spend, I mean, you you said this, I don't know if this is something you're actually doing, but you said about being on a hundred podcasts. Yeah, I mean, that was brain's like, I don't want to be on a hundred podcasts to like write a book. And it's like, ah, but I want to be on a hundred podcasts to be in the top 0.1% of books. That's a different. Yeah, or even I think probably the top two, the top 5% of books would be a big accomplishment. Um, Something, I just had something come up when you were talking. I think also, oh, I, especially if you're an entrepreneur, I think you're like very used to being, sort of getting that quick dopamine hit of satisfaction from like, I do a thing, I get the result. Like I decide I want to sell something and pretty fast, two weeks, four weeks, six weeks, maybe like three months, right? I can do it and I get that. And writing a book, if you're, again, like trying to do this whole long-term establishment, big rollout, blah, 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 it's like building a factory, right? It's like you're investing time and money over a period of years before you see any return. And I think that's like, that's hard for entrepreneur brains, at least our kind of entrepreneurs. Obviously, some entrepreneurs do build businesses where it takes years and years before there's any profit or, you know, like I have a family member who started a financial a fund and it's like, they're, he, you know, he won't get a profit for five years if it even works then. But in our type of entrepreneurial life of like, I'm a quick start and I want to like, I have an idea and then I want to execute it and then I'm going to get a return, you know, I'm going to get a return on it real fast. This has been quite a like, it's, it's like a different phenomenon and it feels, um, one of the things I love about entrepreneurship is sort of that there's always more time in the sense of like, if I launch something, it doesn't work. I'll just try it again. Right. And then this is like a scenario where it's sort of like, well, kind of like a jury trial. It's like, if you are convicted that you don't get to try it again, because it didn't work, you know, obviously I can keep selling the book, but in terms of, you know, things, there are things about this process, like wanting to get on the bestseller list where like your best shot really is your first week. It's very hard to recapture momentum differently. So that has been like a challenge for my brain. I mean, I think those of us who are used to being, um, what's the right way to say this? It's like those of us who are used to getting a lot of dopamine from being very fast acting and efficient and like making great use of our time in the short term, it's like challenging for your brain to put in a lot of time and effort into something that you're like, well, I fucking hope that works out. <laughs> like, like, you know, it's like this factory better not burn down like the night before it's supposed to start production. Like it's a, it's a, feels like a higher risk, higher reward kind of process. Yes. And I also wonder what happens in our brain when we're focused on like just the end, the factory being built or the production line being automated, whatever it might be. And we're missing like actually as we go, all the like yeah. skills and all the things that we're learning and like all the, because we're like, like you said, it's like, it's a very clear, big goal and the yeah. brain is going to hyper-focus on that. And it's like, what's it missing along the way? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think there's, right. And that's when, when you're framing what your goal is in the beginning, I think that's the, like, how do I frame what is like the ultimate outcome I want? And then also what are the, like, what does Brooke Castillo calls like strategic byproducts? Like what are the things along the way that are going to be, you know, valuable? Like, you know, if this 
if World War Three breaks out the week before the book comes out and no, you know, I wrote the book still, I have the book, I can use the book, like that's a strategic byproduct. I've learned a lot about the publishing industry. I've learned how to sell a book, which I'd never, you know, done before. Um, but I, you know, I think like there is a, there's an element to which my kind of blithe, like I can just add anything to my plate. I can do what, you know, it's fine. I think was, was based. It's almost like, I feel like I'm living in two different time systems. I'm living in like entrepreneur time where like, I can always move things around or make them fit or get it done or do it this way. Or like, you know, it's sort of like, everything's very like flexible and everybody I'm working with works for me. And like, I can sort of, I have like 80% control sort of, of the time space continuum. And that I'm now also moving in this other arena in which I have like 40% control of the time space continuum maybe. And so I feel this very like switching my brain back and forth between those things is like disjointing. Yes. I don't know if that makes sense, but. It does. And I, I don't know if you know this, but we all, we, we partner now and work with corporates and teams and companies and it's the same thing, right? I'm like, oh, you want to go? Let's just go. Like we can do this next week. And it's like, no, no, no. We need to like, you know, email all of our teams, see when people right. can join, find the best time. To, and I'm like, oh, what? Like, we just do another one. contract has just... to go through compliance and then we have to take it to the executive team and then we have to blah, blah, blah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. And I'm like, but like, this all sounds like it's going to take up way more time. Why don't we just get started? Like, let's go. Right. Um, so I think, I think it's, I mean, you tell me your experience, but I think it's part of the fun as entrepreneurs. The reason why we do what we do is because we kind of like to get into new things and not really be experts mm -hmm. and figure things out. What do you think? Yeah. I mean, certainly I think most entrepreneurs have the problem of like, you get good at something and then you're bored and you're like, okay, let me try to make my life harder. But we don't, we're not always conscious that we're doing that. So I think that we feel like we're like, we feel like the victim, like we did this hard thing to ourselves, And then, yeah. you know, I, like I definitely see in my business where I make decisions where like I canceled a popular program that I didn't want to do anymore. And now I'm like, well, why why is it going to be so much harder to make our revenue goal? And I'm like, yeah. well, you canceled one of your program. Like, what are you talking about? You did this to yourself. <laughs> but so there's just this, like, I do feel like there's this unconscious, you know, if you have trained your brain to get a role, to get dopamine, to be rewarded by solving problems, which most of us have, you will always be looking for problems to solve and yes. creating your own problems. Right. And I think, you know, a lot of us do that. Some people do that in their romantic relationships. Some people do that in their family. Some people do that in their work. Some of us do it in all areas. So there's also- <laughs> We're a high of, achiever, overachiever. Yeah, we're, I'm an overachiever. I just like to create problems in every area of my life to then solve and give myself little, you know. I mean, I was talking about this with my partner the other day because he was like, it's hard not to sometimes like feel self-critical of myself because you were like, so efficient like you just I'll tell you about a problem I've been trying to solve for three weeks and you solve it in like 20 minutes and I'm like yeah that's great and also see how like you just look at me adoringly and when I look at you I'm like here's 12 things we could solve like that is the problem with my kind of brain like yeah. it's not just a benefit it's something I have to like notice that my brain feels very sure that every problem it spots is a real problem that it could solve and get a little hit and I have to really manage myself in that process and I see that coming up in the book process too where like with my team and my business I can like solve all I can create and solve all the problems I want and over here in this other world like number one other people have things they think are problems that I don't think are problems and I have to negotiate that and number two like I just see that the sort of breakneck pace you know it is a lot of like back and forth and changing things and that is not sorry there's a little bug that is not um that is again a different time system and not and creates kind of confusion. Yeah. And so it's been also like a lesson in kind of, okay, if I want to operate at a bigger scale. Yes. And how can I like get things done right? How can I do things right, quote unquote, right the first time? Whereas as an entrepreneur, I'm much more used to being like, slapdash, put it out, we'll fix it later. Okay, let's, oh, we could fix that. Let's improve that. You know, like my ideas are coming over time. Mm -hmm. And this has been kind of like it's like I, it's almost like I have to give more time to the conception stage and balance that out better with the execution stage versus being that quick start of like yeah I can get something done immediately but then I'm going to want to improve it 14 times mm. yes and when you've got like a team that are all putting work in to improve it 14 yeah. times it's like very different so they're not thrilled about that also yeah yes um so I don't know if you remember but I remember actually we were working together when you 
finish the first chapter. Do you remember that? Yes, it was like 19 years ago is what it feels like. <laughs> <laughs> and it was 2022? Yeah. I think 20... I mostly wrote the book in 2022. I think that's right. Because yeah. then we edited it in 2023. Yes. Yeah. Amazing. Um, what do you think, like, that version of you that had written that first chapter, like, you sat down, you're speaking with her now, what are you telling her? I'm telling her this, the writing part is only like 10%. Like just, I mean, you know, if I were going to do this again, I would certainly structure my time differently. Like I would not try to, um, I just tried to add that to running my whole business and like, as if I went, didn't, wasn't doing anything else. And I just didn't realize like what a full-time job it is not to write a book. If you want to like write a book and sell it this way and try to get a best, you know, I mean, that's just an entire production that's very different. Like I saw somebody, you know, the other day who has a book that I totally respect and admire that's out in the world, like really celebrating with the number of copies they'd sold, which is amazing. And it was like the amount that I had as my goal to like pre-sell in December, <laughs> like six months before. So, you know, I've set a like impossible goal. Um, but I think, yeah, I mean, I think I would have just told her like, you're worrying so much about the time to write the book. And that is like the least, that's the time you can totally control. The time you're wow. not going to be able to totally control is going to be like, all the stuff that involves all these other people. And yeah. so you need to like plan accordingly for that. So I think that is sort of like learning how to, learning to think, learning to think in these two different time registers and plan in these two different time registers. Yes. Like if I could have taught myself that ahead of time, that's the thing I've learned the most through this process. Yes. And I love what you say there for everyone listening about like, you are responsible for your time and how you spend it. And you cannot be responsible for other people's time and how they spend it and their timeline, time like the timelines and decisions and all of that. And navigating that, I think. Yeah. And not taking responsibility for that. Like we had, I had a something come up in my, the process with the publishing house where um, we had a schedule plan and I had built my business plan around it. And then somebody, you know, the, there was a publishing house delay. And I think, you know, before like pre coaching me fully socialization, me would have just been like, okay, I'll, I'm just going to like somehow squeeze that all in and like stay up all night. And, you know, and I said, I was like, I can't, I can't do this. Like yes. this wasn't the schedule we agreed to. I'm not able to accommodate like this being six weeks late. And, and you know what, in the end, and then they had to change, they changed the release schedule. And I was like, that's not great either, but that's the outcome of this. Like, so making peace with that and not like, I think the way women are socialized, it's like, number one, if anything changes, it's like wrong and it was our fault or like we failed or whatever else. And I think being willing to just say like, you know, this is not, I can't change my whole business schedule around to accommodate this delay and like, what are the other options? And then- you know, the solution was moving the date back. And I was like, well, that's not ideal, but like, that's where we are and I'm going to figure it out. So, but I think that that's something, something I talk about a lot in the book is the way in which women are socialized to feel like they don't have any right to their own time. It's like, they can, like women think they have a right to their own time. If everybody in the world that could possibly do something for has had the thing done and has no requests or desires, then you're allowed to like use an hour the way you want. And so like undoing that socialization around not feeling entitled to our time. And all it's like, we're, we're, we don't even, we don't only feel obligated to the people around us with our time where we feel obligated to the ideas we've absorbed from society about how we should spend our time. And so undoing all of that socialization, I think has also been critical. Like I do work a lot and I choose that. And it means that I like, don't spend as much time with my stepkids as somebody else might, or, and I don't, you know, my partner is the house husband and he handles like, I haven't done addition quite a while. Like, but I had to do a lot of deprogramming work to choose that because that's not what women are socialized to do. We're socialized to put everybody else first and then our own goals and ambitions last. And like switching that has been a lot about the socialization around how I spend my time. Mm, absolutely. Um, I actually recently went into like a senior team of women at a big financial house. I'm speaking about like the top 0.1% of leaders. 
And one of the things that they wanted me to help with was everyone finding space in their day, finding just like an hour in their day, in their week. And what people had been trying was like, I'm going to carve out time for myself. But then inevitably, like someone else wants that time, you give it them. You're like, oh, well, there's a meeting or there's a client or there's a, someone on my team or whatever it is. Like, it's so easy to give our time away. And I think what you just touched on, which is what I want everyone to consider is it initially feels good to say yes to giving your time to someone else because yeah. of how you've been socialized because morally that makes you a good person that makes you kind and generous and like all and the not things. selfish and not, not bad and yeah not, you know it's like we're really trying to avoid the guilt and shame of saying no yes because it's bad and se- exactly like you said selfish and wrong and like evil essentially let's just go there um and then we end up obviously never having time for ourselves right. because I don't think anyone has ever socialized us to find time for ourselves. And yet our brains, like anyone else, I mean, you have spoken about this before, like that hour space, that like rest time, that creativity time, like the return on that time is so much higher than the return on time of like going to a meeting so that someone on the team can hit their like DEI goals and have a woman present, even though you didn't need to be there. Like literally this is what's happening. Um, And it feels terrible at first. So what yeah. would you say to anyone that's like, yeah, you're right. It does feel terrible to say no. And that's why I don't do it. Well, I mean, you, I'm sure you and I both talk a lot about like the willingness to feel. I'll just start that again. So you and I both talk about the willingness to feel negative emotion, right? And I talk about this quite a bit in the book. Like I call it, I say that you have three different options with emotion. You can um, resist it, react to it or receive it. And so resisting is when we try to ignore it. That's when we just go ahead and say yes to everything pretty much, right? React is like the sort of um, when we like, we're not managing our emotion. We're just being reactive. Like, again, that will lead you to say yes, because like shame starts to come up and you're like, "Ah, okay, let me just say yes to get rid of this. And receiving the emotion is like really being willing to let the emotion kind of like sit in your body for a minute and hang out there. So I think probably the key is don't expect it. You know, when we tell, I think part of what happens is when we tell people like, listen, if you do say no, like that time is so generative and creative and productive. And then if that doesn't happen like the first time, then people are kind of like, okay, well then there's no point. See, I could have just gone to the meeting. So I think just assume the first 10 times you're just going to be mostly like trying to deal with the discomfort and maybe scrolling your phone. Eventually, as you get used to doing it and you practice holding that emotion, that's when you'll be able to actually rest or get, have a creative idea or whatever else. But you have to, don't expect the first time you say no to a meeting to then have a brainstorm that changes your whole life. Like, let's assume the first 10 times are going to feel shitty, but eventually your nervous system and your emotional state will get habituated to it. You'll realize like, oh, the world didn't end. I didn't get fired. I didn't die. My child doesn't hate me, whatever it is. I still have a sister, even though I said no to going to that thing. And then your brain will start to be able to use that time and you'll be able to actually kind of restore. Yes. And I think this is an important thing as well that you just touched on. So I love that. Let it be shitty. And the other thing is you are always teaching other people how to treat you and you are always teaching other people how to treat your time. And I think we we skip that over when we're like, oh, I'll just make the exception and go to that meeting. Oh, I'll go to the recital even though, mm. you know, I'm like going to have to stay up till 3 a.m. catching up on the meeting that I didn't go to or whatever it is. There's lots of different, that event with the sister or whatever it might be. We, our brain tricks us into thinking it's one time, mm-hmm. but that one time starts to build like, I don't know what you would call it if you have a word for it, but it's like, kind of like in our brain, the neural pathways, it's like a external neural pathway. It's like a relational pathway, let's mm. say. And that relational pathway is like, I ask, Cara gives. I ask, mm-hmm. Cara gives. So that every time it's getting deeper and deeper so that when I ask and Cara says, like, no, it's what? Like, that's a shock now to my system. Mm-hmm. Yeah, also, it's just not an exception. I mean, anytime somebody's like, oh yeah, well, it's just this once. I'm always like, okay, tell me the last time you did it the other way. And then they can never come up with one. <laughs> Because that brains don't work that way. Brains generally don't do exceptions. Your brain might tell you it's an exception, but yeah. if you actually look at the data, yes, it's not an exception. It's actually yeah. just the way you always do it. So what your brain is saying is like, I know we said we were going to try to do this other thing. This is just an exception to that thing that we said we were going to try to do that we don't actually ever do. We actually always say yes. Yeah. So I wouldn't even believe that. Like if somebody told me that it was an exception, I would just not believe them and be like, you know, yeah. Tell me the last time you did say no. And then they're like, oh, I can't think of one. Okay. It's not yeah. an exception. 
And I think we want to be fair here. Like your brain is highly motivated. And I'm sure you speak about this in the book because this is called Take Back Your Brain. So your brain is highly motivated to keep doing what it's always done. So what you speak about, about the importance of how we've been socialized around it. And I'm sure this is like in the book, you'll get a deep dive into all of this. Um, But what was I just saying? Brain. Keep well, doing- brains want to be efficient, right? So they're like, they do what they've always done. I mean, that's one of the wild things about being a human is your brain will like be doing one thing and telling you a totally different story about yes! it. Yes! That seems like very persuasive. Yes. But actually, so your brain is actually motivated by just maintaining the status quo, but then it tells you this whole like story about what it's doing and it may not match at all, right? Like people will constantly tell me stories in coaching that don't match what's actually happening in their brain or their behavior at all. Yes, the brain is a little liar and like we don't need to hate on her, but like she's, she's definitely- a little fabulous. It's like a little kid who's like, and then a unicorn came to school today, and then I went on the magic rainbow, you know, and you're just like, Oh, okay, cool. But you don't actually believe that. But with our brains, we're like, Wow, really? Yeah. I do say no a lot, and this is an exception. Awesome. But that's yeah. not actually what's happening. And this is a really justifiable exception for the reason that my brain keeps telling me, which is like, right. this is a really good reason yeah. to go which again. It always is. Which it always yeah. is. Always yeah. is. So good. Um, is there anything in particular about the book as it relates to time that you would love to share with people or think that people will get a lot of value from in reading it? Yeah, I think that if you tend to have kind of black and white thinking about your time, the the chapter well the whole book but the chapter also will be really valuable because one of the things I see is um, one of the things that's very important for me in my work and throughout the book is bringing a kind of intersectional feminist lens to this work which means like acknowledging that people live in different identities and receive different socialization and face different systems and structures right so obviously if you are you know a straight white woman with inherited wealth like you have a different time set of time management challenges than somebody who is a you know woman of color who couldn't get a a college loan and is working you know a 13 hour day in a minimum wage job so there's all sorts of different intersections of different identities that can impact these things but it is also true that within anybody's life there are moments of choice and there are moments of prioritization and I think You know, if we do, you know, I can very easily say to myself, like, yeah, okay, like other people can stop working at six. I own a business and the buck always stops with me and I'm supporting my whole family, which, you know, my partner and my stepkids. And so I have to keep working. I have to do this. Right. I, you know, I tell myself these stories also. And I think that there's sort of um, it's important to like spend a few minutes at least in doing the work of looking at your life and okay maybe you don't have control over all of your time but there's some of your time you have control over and where can you make even a small choice like we under we think it's actually about the time and of course it's actually about your thoughts about the time so you know you can have 20 minutes a day that you get to decide how to spend in a way that's important to you but if you take ownership of that and actually do it it's going to make a huge difference in your mental and emotional state about it just because of how humans are wired and our drives for like autonomy and control. So I think sort of going through the, every every chapter in the book has exercises. It's not just like me talking at you. It's like, here's questions to answer. Here's, you know, and I think going through the exercises in that chapter, wherever you are in the spectrum in terms of like how much quote unquote free time you have or how much, you know, your time is spoken for in ways you can't control will help you um, get what you're really after, which is the feeling of being in, you know, the thought and feeling of being in control of your time, spending some time the way you want to. So I sort of, I think the, the bottom line is like focus less. It's not really about how much time is on your calendar that you can do what you want with. It's about how are you thinking and feeling about the time control that you do have and the exercise in the book will help you sort of sort that out. Yes. And what I love about that too is some people might be like listening and think, no, I literally don't have 20 minutes. But I want you to even consider maybe you don't have 20 minutes where you could do anything with your time, but maybe you have a 20 minute, you know, commute to work. And on that 20 minute commute to your work, there are certain choices that you have. So I just, and I know you speak about this in the book that against the black or white thinking, the all or nothing thinking. So I just wanted to point that out to anyone listening that like what Cara is not saying is you must have 20 minutes like where you could like be in a field roaming around. Right. Like, rolling around, like <laughs> no, you know? no fields. But also sort of 
what like so i mean i coach moms a lot who right have a real like moms who are primary care provide who are the primary parent and work full time and like that is like a huge right time crunch but when i dig into it there's almost always like can you put your kid in front of youtube for 20 minutes or whatever it is, well, no, because if I ever let my kid watch a screen, then I'm a bad mom. And then, but right. And you're like, okay, well, it's just important to know that that's an option. You can choose not to, but then you are, it's surfacing all the ways that you do make choices that impact what time, how you spend the time that's available to you. And you can totally still choose to make those choices. But just knowing that you're doing that and choosing feels very different from telling yourself, I can't, I have no control over this. Absolutely. Um, Amazing. So I just wanted to let you know before we close out and remind people where they can go get the book that I was doing an event in London last week for women in finance. And at the end, I was speaking to everyone and um, I was chatting with someone and I said like, oh, like, do, do you have experience in coaching? And she was like, yes, I am in and fuck your brain by Cara Lowenthal. And I was like, oh, brilliant. Um, I said, and she's got a book coming out. And she said, yes, I pre-ordered it already. So I just think it's fun <laughs> to know that I was, Who in, was London, it? in London. Pardon? Who was it? Well, I'm not going to name drop here. Oh, okay. Um, I thought it was but... a coach. Okay. Oh, no, it's not. No, it's not a coach. It's a woman in finance. Who oh, 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 oh. Yes, know. okay, sorry. I, I didn't know her um, personally. It. We met there. Um, but I think it's awesome. cool to think in a room of 50 women who work in finance in London, mm -hmm. um, someone has already pre-ordered your book. And so... Well, and there's a UK... We have a UK-specific version. So we should have probably said that also. I don't you know where the listenership is. But if you are in the UK, Australia, New Zealand... You have your own version, which you can order. Again, you can still go to my website, but we have a, um, there's a separate version for you guys. It's all the same content and stuff, but you got your is own little same, cover. Is it the right spelling? Is it like the UK spelling or the US spelling? Uh, I don't know what they've done. I haven't gotten those for a second pass pages. Uh, they spelled my name the right way, which is what I really care about. It's a good thing. Um, but you can still order through our, on the site. We have a million, not a million, we have a bunch of um, really great bonuses, like a free, there's like a 30 day guided journal you get if you pre order through me um through our site there's bonus audios there's like tickets to live launch events or virtual events so all that's on the site but um uk australia new zealand you get your own special version you can still order through the site and if you're international somewhere else you can still order through the site we have worked out on the back end a way to get you your bonuses amazing i'm definitely going to go from this interview to ordering my books <laughs> straight away and i just encourage you all to as well i think i just love learning through different mediums um i love a book with a highlighter pen or like a little pen and whatever and just like um so I'm so excited for everyone whose life this gets to impact and the work that you do you know I hugely admire and it's fun to have been there with you at the start it's fun to have you here <laughs> hopefully and... be there at the end if we survive that long <laughs> um so yeah thank you so much for being here so the website is takebackyourbrain.book book yes takebackyourbrain.com is not ours it is like some okay. old defunct marketing website we can't get takebackyourbrainbook.com okay. <laughs> okay. i love how these things we were looking for time hackers and we like yeah there's people that don't use it but you can't find i'm like give me your I website know. they don't want to give it to you yeah. yeah um so takebackyourbrainbook.com um I mean, I think this is going to be a, a great one to have like book clubs about and wine evenings. We used to do that a lot. Maybe I'm going We to have help. a book club bonus. If you order 10 books, we'll send you a little book club in a box that kind of helps you like set up your book club, like what to, add, you know, emails, send to invite people, what to discuss, snack ideas, the whole nine yards. Snack ideas? Are these UK <laughs> snacks or American snacks? Oh no. Uh, you know, brain themed snacks. We got to go a little kitschy with it. You can make your own. Okay, fine. <laughs> Just checking. Don't want to be disappointed. Okay, amazing. Well, thank you for being here and for sharing that like it doesn't, and I don't think we really touched on this hugely, but it doesn't take time to create the book, but you want to invest time um, mm -hmm. in the why behind any big project you are doing yes. and just keep coming back to that goal and know that there's going to be fun surprises and I call them externalities, like positive externalities mm -hmm. along the way that you benefit from. Um, and it's really fun to have, been through this process with you and I'm very excited for all the lives it's gonna impact thanks for having me thank you so much all right bye everyone the link is in the show notes enjoy <laughs>